Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. My name is Alan Fadling, and I invite you to listen to leadership conversations that will help you to develop healthy rhythms of rest and work and to live fuller in friendship with God. I hope this podcast will help you to overcome hurry and make time for what matters most. And now, enjoy today's episode. Hey, friends, welcome to episode 233 of the podcast. My name is Alan, and I'm so glad you've joined me here. I'm hopeful that our time together will help you rediscover an unhurried way of life and leadership. Each week on the podcast, we have leadership conversations to help us lead better in the spirit of Jesus' unhurried way, the way of leadership that flows from a full soul instead of an empty one. Sometimes I'm talking with fellow authors, and sometimes I'm talking with leaders just like you who are learning to live and lead at the fruitful pace of grace and peace. Today, I'm sharing a recent conversation with James K.A. Smith about his latest book, How to Inhabit Time. The moment I saw this title, I knew there would be some wonderful intersections with our core idea here of learning to live and lead in the unhurried way of Jesus. And, And I wasn't wrong about that. There is a depth of thinking and a beauty of language in this book. It really was a pleasure to read. You see, there's an invitation to live well in the present moment. The language of inhabiting takes me to the invitation of Jesus to abide in him like a branch remains connected to a vine so that it'll be lush and fruitful. Each now is the place where we can do just that. But we are so often rushing past the present moment, or trying to, and missing the grace that is available to us right here and right now. I know you're going to enjoy our conversation about these things today. My guest, James K.A. Smith, is a popular speaker who has written many books, including On the Road with St. Augustine, You Are What You Love, Desiring the Kingdom, and Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? All of these Christianity Today Book Award winners. He is professor of philosophy at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he holds the Gary and Henrietta Biker Chair in Applied Reformed Theology and Worldview. He was editor-in-chief of Comet Magazine from 2013 to 2018 and is now editor-in-chief of Image, a quarterly journal at the intersection of art, faith, and mystery. Smith has written for Christianity Today, The Christian Century, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and The Washington Post. Now, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. If you find these episodes helpful, please follow, rate, and review. And be sure to share this podcast with your friends. Now, Let's dive into my conversation with Dr. James K.A. Smith. On today's Unhurried Living podcast, I'm pleased to have James K.A. Smith, author of How to Inhabit Time. Jamie, thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. Oh, it's great to chat with you, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've been looking forward to it very much. Uh, ever since I saw the title of your book, I I sense that there would be some wonderful intersections with our, you know, so core themes as unhurried living podcast. Um, before we get into much of that, I wonder if you could just tell some of the story of how this particular book uh, came to be. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I feel like it kind of has multiple uh, uh, impulses. I. I As you know, from the beginning of the book, in some ways, uh, I think one of the generators of it was my own experience uh, in therapy and counseling. Mm, (laughs) So, and I want to be like candid about that. And so I feel like uh, some of the soul work that I had to do uh, grappling with some depression and trauma in my life was, Mm. was just a kind of, um, an arena for new spiritual insight. And so I think that's part of it. I think the other side of it is, um, you know, my work for 10 or 15 years has really been part of what I would call the spiritual formation 
project, yeah. uh, which you are very familiar with. And, um, I think, I think, um, I, I just noticed that maybe one aspect of that that hasn't received adequate emphasis is thinking through the dynamics of time and temporality yeah. and um, our historicity as human creatures. So I guess that's the other thing is I'm just trying to sort of further contribute, develop and extend that conversation. Um, so it, it sort of grows out of past projects in that sense. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I, and I appreciate your work on this theme of time and the idea formation implies uh, a process, you know, both a historical process, but also a life uh, yes. process. So I really enjoyed in your preface, um, just to quote you a couple of times, you invite us to find a way to hit the pause button on our frenetic absorption in the everyday and to resist the tyranny of the urgent. And then you remind us that slowing down is how we learn to notice what we usually speed past. And so can you say more about how hurry hurry is one of those unhelpful ways we relate to time? So true. And, and this is where it, it resonates, obviously, with conversations that you've been having for a long time. I, I um, the, the how to inhabit time is really an invitation to a kind of exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say fundamentally that exercise requires the hard work of reflection yeah. on how we spend our days but that that hard work of reflection you can't do at 1 million miles an hour and you yeah. also can't do it when you are incessantly distracted by all kinds of other calls and obligations and responsibilities and you know bright shiny flashing things so I would say, um, I think the other thing I'm trying to do new in this book is it's a kind of writing that's inviting people into a more contemplative mode. Yes. And um, I, I think you're familiar enough, I'm sure, with uh, – I still think a lot of Christian writing is – trying to convey information and therefore we've trained a lot of readers to read books to sort of learn information or to get the seven tips and tricks that are going to change their life whereas this book is like if people come to this book with that expectation they'll be very disappointed <laughs> um it's almost like sometimes i'm trying to create a little bit of friction so that you have to slow down like you can't you can't sort of fly past this page easily. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to encounter a philosopher and you're going to have to sort of think hard for a little bit, but that's part of the slowdown. I think yes. that's, that's required for contemplation. Well, and I, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I think in the preface, you sort of intentionally described the writing as poetic, you know, it's, there's, there's Shooting more storytelling. Least, well, yes. I think, and I think you hit it. There's more storytelling. There's more imaginative language. And that kind of writing also just by design slows you down. You can't read it fast. You can't skim yeah. poetry. It just doesn't, no. doesn't no, work. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, and it's okay if it's a, you're right. In some ways I'm, I'm uh, poetic would be a way of describing it. It's also a way of trying to paint. Yeah. It's an impressionism of words. And, and it's okay if sometimes the page, you just sort of have to stop and like sort of, muse on that do you know what i mean you don't rush yeah. to the next page that's that's an accomplishment <laughs> <laughs> yes well i i sense that i think you did that really well and i appreciated it thank you so at one point i hear you inviting us to dwell with god one of the ways we can talk about this idea of inhabiting time in the present moment and you say listening to the spirit is not you know some archaeological dig for an original deposit but it's rather an attunement to a god with uh, still speaking, still surprising, still revealing. And, and I just found that ring so true. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the sort of canned ways that we think about history in the past is that it's what's left behind. Mm -hmm. Whereas a big part of what I'm trying to show in the book is, no, history is what you carry. Uh, um, but precisely because of that, I think the most important, if you will, name for God in this exercise is Emmanuel. Yeah. So the God that is 
the God we know as temporal, historical, mortal creatures is the God who is with us. And the way we experience God's eternality is is not because we get sky hooked out of time and get to sort of surf above the flux. It's rather that we experience God's incarnate withness, mm. which endures, which is steadfast, which is faithful. Uh, and I, I think leaning into and entrusting ourselves to God's continued presence with is part of the way that we learn to sort of let go of things, how to venture into the future, how to live hopefully. Uh, so I think that with theme is, is a real base note of, of the book. Well, and, and um, that sense of with in my actual lived experience, you know, that yes, as you say, not sky hooked out and detached from the realities of my moment to moment, day to day, or my history, uh, the wounds yes. of it, the gifts of it, whatever it is, all of that is the place where God is with me. Exactly. And, and it's with you. It's, it's, it's with the very like distinct signature of your history and your experience and your life. So that on the one hand, we, we you know, we celebrate God's omnipresence and eternality, but we know God as the God who is utterly concrete and specific and meeting and intersecting with my life uh, in an intimate way. So it's, it's that, it's that intimacy of the withness that I think is crucial. Right. I, uh, maybe a way to say that is, you know, that practicing the presence of God doesn't take me out of my life. In some ways it roots me even more deeply in my actual lived experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, which is why part of the exercise is to, um, become attuned yeah. to the particularity of my experience, right? So part of the work is how is the spirit afoot in my life, given my history and what God has in store for me to come? Yeah, uh, that is so good. Uh, one of the phrases I enjoyed um, that you used is uh, temporal faithfulness. You talked about how we might cultivate that. And you said that a core virtue in that would be the virtue of discernment. Um, I don't know that discernment is language that a lot of Christ followers live a lot with. Some do, I think. But can you say more about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to know that that's um, uh, maybe not common. That's. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, w I would love to hear hear more about that because maybe this is partly my. Um, Maybe this is some of my Pentecostal heritage coming to the surface too, where ah. discernment was like a really, really crucial theme, right? Because it would have been. That's if, true, if you, right? If you if you have a sense that the spirit is isn't just didn't just do work in the past, but is alive and active in the present. Yeah. Nonetheless, you have to sort of discern and sort of read the signs of the times and just, you know, the prophets are subject to the prophets. I, I think the reason why discernment is so crucial is precisely because we don't believe that God has only acted in the past. He, and yes. God didn't just leave a deposit in the first century. Instead, Jesus promised that the spirit would lead us into all truth. And that is an ongoing endeavor. Sure and is. precisely because of the dynamism of God's withness and God's spirit's activity in the world and in the body of Christ, it means that in every moment we are trying to ask ourselves, what does God want of us now? And where can we join the Spirit's work in this moment, in this yeah. intersection in which we find ourselves? And there's no, of, of course, we are we are gratefully receiving the wisdom and heritage of the traditio, the tradition that has been handed down. But that doesn't alleviate us. Faithfulness is not merely the repetition or prolongation of the past. Faithfulness is is the hard work of answering the. Spirit call of the spirit anew every moment and afresh in the time in which we find ourselves. And that's why you have to, it, it, discernment is crucial because sometimes that will feel a little bit like you're working without a net <laughs> or sometimes, I, I just think we have to lean into this. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. sometimes it will mean 
um, you, you you are standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, right? You are you are the heir of gifts that have been handed down, but in no one has lived this moment right now before. And yeah. so what God is calling us to, it requires a kind of an attunement that isn't just, you know, a cookie cutter yeah. position of something that's happened before. I don't know no, if that's a very good explanation of discernment, no. but it's. Well, it's helpful. And it's helpful to hear you connect it to some of your, you know, Pentecostal charismatic heritage, because there, yes, discernment was very much front and center. God was doing something surprising. We had to be yes. sure it was the spirit of God and not some other spirit. I mean, so there yes. was a working experience of discernment. I'm thinking of, of traditions that I've come out of where theological reflection and doctrinal affirmations were the key. And it didn't seem like discernment was needed much there. It was more like a research project. That's I don't mean to belittle. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Where you're saying the reason discernment becomes so important is there is something happening now that the Spirit of God is at work now, speaking now, moving now, working now. Yes. Do I see that? Am I aware? Am I sorting you know, through the ways in which this may indeed be God at work? So that I can cooperate. And so, you know, certainly in the spiritual formation uh, tradition that's a little more recent in the Protestant um, church here, I think discernment becomes really critical. Yeah. And I think I think there's a there's a collective work of discernment that also has to happen. Right. So it's on the one hand, it's me discerning what is God asking of me now or or maybe it's maybe we don't experience it so much like moment to moment, but it's sort of seasonal, right? Like what is God asking of me in this season? Or is God asking me to shift into a new season of focus? So there is an individual dynamic of discernment, but then I also think there's a collective dynamic, which is what is God asking the body of Christ to do now, given the context in which we find ourselves. And and this is, this is, Part of what makes it difficult is, like you say, it's not just figuring out what we did before. It's the hard work of saying, no, what are we doing going forward? And Christians are going to disagree on these things, right? And so we have yeah. to, it's a, it's very much a communal endeavor and we, we can't rush our discernment either. You know, like there's, it, it, to me, the templates of discernment are Acts 10, Acts 15. Do you know what I mean? Where yes. Jesus has promised the spirit is going to lead you into all truth. The spirit comes at Pentecost. It's not like that solved all the problems, right? <laughs> no. That started the problems. <laughs> and so now what are we going to do with Gentiles? What are we going to do with, you know, um, uh, uh, widows? What? How are we going to yeah. respond to these calls? I think that the models of the church wrestling and what happens? They convene, they have councils, they argue, they disagree. I think that's, we, we need to learn to not be fearful of that hard work of discernment. Yes, that's really well said. And so all of that really comes into the present as a way of saying, how do I live this life of communion with God myself in community, in my world. And certainly discernment is really critical, uh, both as an individual virtue, but also as a communal practice. Yeah. Well, one of the other chapters, you bring in the theme of grace. You say grace is not a time machine. I think this sort of is following on pretty nicely to the conversation we just had. Yeah. It's not a time machine. Grace isn't a reset button. Grace isn't something Oh, grace is something even more unbelievable. It's restoration. It isn't undoing. It is overcoming. And I appreciate that vision of grace. Can you say more about that as it relates to inhabiting time? Yeah, I um, I think there are, if if we have disordered conceptions of time, right? If we if we live in what I call in the book no when, right? Yes. As if we inhabit nowhere and we live no when. Um, it, it does funky things to how we think about redemption, sanctification, you know, yeah. transformation. And, and I think there are too many forms of Christian holiness that effectively imagine that salvation, redemption, sanctification is a kind of blank slateism. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. oh, what what it, what happens, what it means, for example, quote, to be born again is 
as if the reset button is hit on my character in this video game that we call life. And now everything that has gone before is sort of like left behind. And now to be a new creation is to have, you know, a new start, a blank slate. I I don't think that's the way God works. Uh, and I, yeah. I don't think that's what we see God doing in the scriptures. Instead, what happens is, Absolutely. It's restoration, it's renewal, it's resurrection. But it what that looks like is actually God redeeming and taking up yeah. my history, my story, my past. You see Paul appealing to his past all the time. And, and what's right. going on there is God isn't trying to efface or erase what I have lived through. In a way, what God can do in, in my redemption is deploy that history, mm. de- like sort of uh, um, unleash something about my experience where even it's, it's as Henri Nouwen talks about it, you know, you become the wounded healer Yes, where in a sense, the wounds are lamentable and, and, and sad, but now in my new creation state, you know, I still have the scars, but those are also scars that have made me sensitive to my neighbors in a way that God wants to use. And so God saves me. He doesn't yeah. start a new character. Yeah, no, that's so good. Uh, in in one, one of the books I wrote, I, I remember a line that echoes now, and that is that we are not um, junk needing to be radically repurposed. We are masterpieces needing to be restored. And there's this sense of original goodness and and my story with yes. its wounds, its traumas, its challenges, as you say, those become points of grace. This becomes grace. I now can live in the communities yeah. where God plants me. It's not theoretical grace. It's not right. merely a doctrinal theological category, but it is a, a facet of how I'm learning to live my life. Yes. And, and only the sort of, what would you call it? The repertoire of things that Alan has experienced is what God wants to use as, as he unleashes you to be an ambassador of his grace to the world. Right. And so that, that sense of God gathers up the, there's a, there's a closing prayer in the book that comes actually from the Kenyan Anglican church. Oh, that was beautiful. And it's, and it says, it's something like, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, take up the fragments of our history and redeem them. And, and the way I think of that is God kind of takes the shards of my experience, but from those fragments and shards, he makes a mosaic that I couldn't have ever have imagined. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so there was another line that I really enjoyed. Maybe this sort of follows on from what we're talking about. You wrote about wisdom. Uh, at, I think three points in the book, you reflect on a passage from the book of Ecclesiastes. And one of your lines was that wisdom is the unhurried fruit of time ser- time served as a mortal. Um, I, I like that line. I, I think we're living at a time where people are starved for wisdom they may not know that that's what they want and need, but I don't know if they necessarily understand much about how wisdom works. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. No, no I, I absolutely agree. I think um, we live in an age in which we think we have so much insight and enlightenment yeah. and information and data. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we think. Uh, we can sort of algorithm our way to solutions, but wisdom is um, wisdom is a kind of understanding and insight that doesn't just come from the flash or epiphany of getting an idea. Yeah, it's a kind of attunement to God and the world that is forged and and formed because of what you undergo. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if, if you got this sense, but I would say how to inhabit time for me is very much a middle aged book. <laughs> I, I so pick I up mean, on that. You know, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm 52 and there's no way my 42 year old self 
could have written this book. And Uh, there's no way my 25 year old self could have imagined it because my 25 year old or my 30 year old self thought, Oh, um, wisdom is being smart. Yes. Wisdom is being intelligent. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm an academic and I sort of think, oh, I'm smart enough and I'm, I'm intelligent. And so I should be able to figure things out just with my native intelligence. And it took me 25 years to realize, no, no, there's a kind of insight and understanding that you can't rush just because you're intelligent. You have to go through things. You have to undergo experiences because there's an incubation period. There's a gestation period and you can't, you can't rush it. And it's an offense, I think, to our culture. I I think it's a big offense to sort of Silicon Valley tech culture where, you know, everybody went to Stanford and is brilliant. Everybody is brilliant. (laughs) But you can't think your way to wisdom. That sounds crazy, but you can't think your way to wisdom. No, that's so well said. I, yeah, I really resonate with what you're sharing. Um, you know, I just entered my 60s here in the last couple of years. And, wow. you know, it's like what it looks like now to inhabit time. You know, I remember uh, some of the seasons of, you know, 40s and 50s and the wrestlings and the identity battles and and some things. And now, you know, uh, I just think wisdom is is I've learned how truth works. I've learned to be at home in in kingdom reality. It's it's it it's um, bearing fruit in how I actually interact with people. It's, yeah. it's lived. I, I'm not thinking about, you know, I'm not talking about, I'm speaking from somehow. Um, and I love that sense. And, and that kind of wisdom, it, it never plays nice with pride. The kind of pride that's, <laughs> no. that, that, no, that that's knowledge, sure. you know, knowing about stuff, theoretical, whatever wisdom never plays nice with pride. It always sort of grows in the, yeah. you know, the humus, the humility, Yes. Uh, reality. Yeah. No, that's beautifully said. And I, and I bet you have a sense that, um, or I bet there's a trick to not resent that you didn't get there faster <laughs> because there might yeah. be a sense in which there was just no way to get there faster. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, I, I think that's part yeah. of, for me, learning to live as a mortal is a, is a very humbling endeavor because you start to realize you have, you have to hold things with open hands, but you start to realize um, only at the end of a season, sometimes do you, do you see something coalesce right. and then you get it and you're like, wow, maybe I could have avoided all of that. <laughs> right. right. Like, gosh, if somebody, if I only knew now, if I only knew then what I know now, but you, you couldn't have, like it was, it was unavailable to you. No. Um, and so then the trick is to not resent what you had to undergo to get to where you are now. Which is not the same as excusing, you know, difficult, you know, we, we both lament and hope simultaneously. No, that's, that's really right. You know, and maybe somebody could have told me about something 20 years ago and I would have had that bit of data stored away, but I wouldn't have known how it worked. I I wouldn't have known that literally how to understand it. Like I just wouldn't. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, I've come to find that just a gratitude for the journey that God has to take us all on to, to become discerning and wise. It involves pain. Um, not my favorite part of the journey, but in some ways that does sort of give me a chance to test truth and to test reality and to discover this is actually this is as things are. What God, what Jesus says is a beautiful description of how things actually are. But I didn't learn that without having it tested in some difficult yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. Well, uh, there was a point in one of the chapters, it's titled Seasons of the Heart. You use the metaphor of fast food and this sort of slow food movement. And I love the words you use to describe each of those because I think they sort of speak even more broadly to this hurried, unhurried vision of time. So you said fast food culture values convenience, uniformity, availability, speed. The slow food culture values 
biodiversity, stewardship, simplicity, interconnectedness. I wonder if you can kind of reflect on those two sort of ways of thinking about eating more broadly and sort of ways of living. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that sort of um, the fast food way of living is ultimately dehumanizing. Yeah. Because what happens is, is it races over and past deep human needs that we have been made for. And so what happens is you you rush to accumulate or conquer or accomplish um, and you're not – in some ways you are starving other aspects of who you are, which are the probably the more significant aspects of who we are, right? So it's so yeah. easy when you're young and you think my identity is going to be bound up with my accomplishments. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to race and chase – accomplishment because that is going to who that's what's going to make me who I am. Yeah. And then you achieve the accomplishment and you realize, Hmm, that's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> uh, that's, and, yeah. and, or you, or you fail. And then yeah. all of a sudden, who am I? Whereas if, if I had, you know, slowed down and say valued interconnectedness yeah. and realized that, my friendships are a much more significant factor in who I am than the books I've written. I, I think there's something about that. Um, slowing down is precisely what helps us see the deeper human hungers and needs that require attention and, and yeah. nourishment. Yeah, that's really well said. I, you can't at you, you can't at highway speed appreciate the differences and the goodness of differences uh, between us. You you can't appreciate that your life is given instead of grabbed or earned or taken. You just can't do any of those things at high speed. And maybe part of it is is age. You know, you you realize that you said in your twenties and your thirties, you've got energy to burn. You can fudge <laughs> things, you know, you can, you can do all nighters, whatever it is. Imagining that all of that, of course, is establishing your wonderful sense of self. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe yes. Not. Well, it's one the, of the places where, yeah. you know, I think, um, I, I do, you know, as I was, I was writing this book in the pandemic, a mm. good chunk of it. And yeah, I, I think a lot of us, you know, we're look. That was a slowdown experience for many of us. For and many of us, if if I look for the gifts that I still want to carry from it, um, it is very much a kind of pace to a life that I I sort of found parts of myself that I had forgotten. We found parts of ourselves that we had forgotten, and yes. I found parts of God's world that I had not. A, been attentive to and i don't in that sense i don't want to get back to normal yeah uh i i want to carry out of that experience a, a speed uh that is more humane yeah well in the maybe the last few pages of your book you said this you said our frenetic busyness is so often a practical outworking of an unconscious despair it's a refusal of hope when, when I'm frantically busy, I subtly, or maybe not so subtly, assume that everything depends on me, which I think is now just another facet of what you were just saying. Yeah, I, I think, um, and then this is, I, I think this is a cultural diagnosis at yeah. a collective level as well. I think it's precisely because we have become um, so self-dependent. Or, or let, let me let me put it this way. I, I'm a I'm a scholar of, of St. Augustine. And so one of the reasons St. Augustine was always fighting what he called Pelagianism, which was a, yeah. a version of a sort of Christianity, which thought at the end of the day, we save ourselves. We save yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And I think one of the effects of, of secularization in our culture is we think we save ourselves. We think we're all we've got. And then what happens is now whenever we see challenges or injustices or things that need to be addressed we think it's entirely on us yeah and i think that that scenario is what engenders both our franticness and the despair because 
I think we know at a deeper level or we eventually experience, we don't have the answers. We don't have all the solutions on our own. So hope, I think hope is only possible. True hope is only possible, not optimism. Yeah. But true hope is only possible where we are entrusting ourselves to the one who is bigger and ahead of us. And, you know, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, if you want an analog in recovery programs, um, it is really crucial that everybody finds a higher power. You can't actually do this on your own. Yeah. And I think, um, only when we learn to entrust ourselves to the God whose kingdom is coming, could you actually learn to rest. So I, that's why I think there's such a connection between Sabbath and hope. There's a connection between eschatology, where we place our hope, and how we live in the present um, less frantically. Yeah. I was just, as I was thinking thinking about hope, I'm just thinking of that that beautiful trio of faith, hope, love, you know, that culturally we've lost faith. We've lost the capacity to trust. And so our anxiety is just so high. We've, we've lost hope. And so our despair is so deep. Uh, And we've lost the sense that love is at the center of everything. And all of this in part is a fruit of our hurry. It's a fruit of our inability to stop and simply be, and see and uh, see another and, and all of that. And I bet I bet it actually works on kind of a feedback loop, right? So I uh, think our hurry prevents us from seeing and appreciating and responding gratefully, but then also our misplaced self confidence and self dependence is precisely what engenders our frantic hurry to accomplish what we think we need to accomplish. And now it's just this terrible vicious circle. It really, where, is vicious. where we, we're trapped. That's so true. No. Well, I, I so appreciated the chance to talk. I wonder if you would just be willing to share a word of encouragement, you know, to our listeners about this invitation to inhabit time. Well, how might they take a next step somehow? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think it's living into this twin promise or confidence of, um, God's always on the one hand being ahead of us <laughs> preparing the way and yet always with us and so the you know the, whenever to me the gospel is almost always summarized in fear not and lift up your hearts and that yeah. in living between those two things is i think where we experience the witness of god in the now precisely because we know that god is steadfast beyond any particular moment. And I, I think it's that sort of holy patience uh, that God gifts us with to sort of receive that. That is beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Again, today, my guest has been James K.A. Smith, author of How to Inhabit Time. Jamie, thanks again for taking time. Thanks. A rich conversation. Thanks so much for your attention to themes in the book. I, I, I love the intersection of, of our overlapping concerns. I did, too. Yeah, thank you. What a rich conversation. I I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I wonder what you sense might be a particular invitation from God in what you just heard. What simple next step might God be inviting you to take in your own life and leadership? Now, in the remaining episodes of this fall season, I'll be talking with authors Tom Nelson and Lori Wilbert, I'll also be sharing a few episodes toward the end of this season to introduce my latest book and the third volume of my Unhurried Trilogy, A Year of Slowing Down, Daily Devotions for Unhurried Living. It releases in early December, and you can pre-order it now at your favorite bookseller. I can't wait to share these episodes with you. Now, if you'd like to receive more help from Unhurried Living, I invite you to join our Unhurried Daily email list. For 40 days, we'll send you a brief daily email that offers personal reflections from life and scripture to help you take the next step in following Jesus' unhurried way. You can sign up on our website at unhurriedliving.com. We are honored to encourage thousands of leaders just like you. Thanks for listening. 
You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join me next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus' unhurried way of life and leadership.